All right, welcome back. We've now discussed all of those structural features and how to, what to do about it. Um, and so now, these days, um, actually still relatively recently, you can scatter you know, tens of thousands of photons off of um, you know, gas phase molecules like calcium fluoride or strontium fluoride. Um, and you can scatter so many that you can do something which I'll talk a little bit about more later, which is you can even like laser cool them and trap them and start doing sort of advanced quantum -y stuff that people have been doing with atoms for decades now. Um, but now you can do them with molecules and access this rich and exciting physics that's present in molecules <clears throat> that I will also talk a little bit more about later. Um, it's still fairly new, only four species. This has only happened for four species, and they're all of this sort of type that I've been talking about, this single unpaired S electron polarized away from the bond um, type molecule. So, use a low-lying electronic state, um, find a molecule where this vibration electron decoupling happens. Um, for these, you can use selection rules, for rotation, you can use a one to zero transition. And then for these, you can just basically do modulate your laser to cover all these levels. So there you go. That's how you kind of <clears throat> bridge the entire gap. Um, any questions? That concludes part one. I was just kind of, you know, a little, a few minutes behind. So, but um, yeah. any questions about part one? Sorry? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> there's a secret, there's a, I think there's a fifth species now, but it's a secret, so. It's not in my lab, though. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and the first one was in 2014, which is not that long ago, considering that in atoms this stuff was happening in the 80s. So that's what you do to address all this structure. Um, <clears throat> But to kind of to address something that came up in the things we were chatting about during the break, um, this sort of relies on an understanding of kind of every energy level and internal degree of freedom in the molecule to really kind of navigate this space. And so I think this area is like a, it's a really cool area where physics and chemistry are, are kind of meeting and helping each other a lot. Because um, I think this requires a lot of intuition both from the physics side and the chemistry side. And it's all been developing basically in the last few years. Um, so <clears throat> next, I will talk about, um, someone said, like, why use an atom? Or why not use an atom? Why use a diatomic molecule when you can use an atom? And now I'll ask, why use a diatomic molecule when you could use a polyatomic molecule? Like, why not make it more complicated? Um, and uh, there are actually good reasons why you'd want to do that. Um, um, <clears throat> we will see that the overall structure is actually surprisingly similar. Calcium fluoride, which we talked about, looks a lot like calcium OH or calcium OCH3, um, or even calcium bonded to some big giant thing. Um, then you, you, know, you may ask, uh, why would you be interested in doing that? Um, these additional degrees of freedom give you a lot of very useful handles on things like electric and magnetic field interactions, polarizability. Um, it allows you to add, it gives you access to different species in the ligand, right? Like you could use this uh, optical cycling center to study properties of the ligand or to study properties of this molecule, et cetera. <clears throat> um, so uh, there's a lot of fun stuff you could do with this, um, including for the, for the research I do, the fundamental physics research that I do, we kind of use this polyatomic structure uh, very extensively, although I won't, I won't really talk about that. I'll kind of, you know, talk about some related things. So there are, I bring that up just because there are sort of specific instances where this is useful, as opposed to it being just generally interesting, which I think it is also just generally interesting. <clears throat> as I mentioned earlier, uh, many, many bonding partners bond similarly. So like fluorine bonds for these types of molecules very much like CCH or OCH3 or OH or CH3. This is obviously not in general true. This is a very sort of physicist's view of chemistry. Like, oh, OH is basically fluorine. Like, eh. Um, 
That's not generally true, but for these particular types of molecules, it actually is very true. They bond very similarly. But that's because the electron wave function is metal-centered and like polarized away from the bond. It's much less sensitive to the properties of the bond. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and so, for example, if you, you know, look at like ab initio calculations of CAF versus CAOH, like they look pretty similar, the wave functions at least, the electronic wave functions look pretty similar. <clears throat> and uh, in principle, everything I said about, and again, I should have changed this to photon cycling instead of laser cooling to make it more general. Um, in principle, it's all the kind of, it's very, very similar in terms of you can just you can add lasers to address the different vibrational modes. You can do these rotational tricks. There are more vibrational modes, so you need more lasers. But it's sort of a it's a tractable number of lasers. Um, this has been demonstrated in four species, or I mean, you know, four five-ish species. Um, no, four four species. Um, I just had to count four. Um, and uh, again, it's, it's non-trivial, but it's possible to do this. And this is all happening again in sort of the last few years kind of stuff. Um, to relate back to that other question about like the sort of state of the art in terms of apparatus and technology, the, the laser technology that you need to do this is sort of getting easier and easier. It's still kind of, it's still hard and it's still expensive, but it's to the point where you can, you can realize something like this in, in, a, in a laboratory. So poly the primary difference between polyatomic or a primary and important difference between diatomic and polyatomic molecules is that <clears throat> polyatomic molecules have multiple vibrational degrees of freedom, whereas diatomics have one. And <clears throat> that turns out to be important. I will talk mostly about uh, linear triatomic molecules of the type MOH, where M is a metal like calcium or strontium. So basically the OH analog of these fluorines I've talked about. Um, which are linear in their ground state, at least. Um, more complex species, um, like nonlinear molecules, are sort of conceptually similar, although the details like rapidly get really complicated and, um, in general, I would say are not understood. Um, but for a linear triatomic, we kind of fully understand what's going on in them. Um, they have three vibrational modes. Um, which we label by nu1, nu2, and nu3, um, or v1, v2, v3. Um, there's the M, there, here's the M, there's the O, there's the H. There's the MO stretch mode, there's the OH stretch mode, uh, and then there's, oh, this should be, uh, I've, I swapped the labels on those. Um, that should be, this is nu3. I, pu I put them not in order on the slide. Um, and then this is nu2. Um, so new, uh, right, yeah, so MO stretch, OH stretch, and then there's a bend, bending mode. The bending mode is doubly degenerate because of this cylindrical symmetry. It can bend, you know, like this, or it can bend like this. Um, <clears throat> I'll talk more about that later, but very analogous to the uh, to the case of the like single electron orbiting H two plus. Um, another way to parametrize these eigenstates or these states is superpositions of them, where there's angular momentum of this ligand as it rotates about the nucleus. So if you take a superposition of this and this, depending on the sign, it can be doing that or that. Um, <clears throat> these are not. Neither of these are the physical eigenstates. I'll get to what those are. But these are a handy conceptual way to think about what's happening. Um, <clears throat> and in particular, that gives you sort of an extra quantum number for this new 2 mode, which is L, the projection of the bending angular momentum on the symmetry axis. Um, <clears throat> so we label these states by just write the vibrational states by just writing out these three levels. And we put the superscript, a superscript L. Uh, on this bending mode. <clears throat> Again, what is L? Is it an integer? I know that is a projection, but you assign an integer for it. It is. It, it is an integer. Yeah, and uh, it can go between plus nu minus two. So 
New, new one, two, and three are integers that just count the vibrational quanta. And then L is an integer that goes between plus new two and minus new two in steps of two, not steps of one. And I, I think I actually write that down somewhere later. Um, right. By the way, if you look up the, I, the vibrational modes for a, a linear triatomic in like a textbook, they will not be these. It will be a symmetric stretch and a anti-symmetric stretch and then a bend. But in this case, um, where this is much heavier than this, which is much heavier than this, it turns out that the physical eigenstates are actually much better approximated by this picture. Although in reality, there's some mixture of them. But that's basically what they look like. And this, this mode, the OH stretch mode, for what I'm going to talk about is basically irrelevant because it's very far away from this metal. It's hard to excite, it's hard to do anything to this metal or the electron on this metal and make the OH bond do anything. So it's basically just a spectator that's along for the ride and we're just gonna ignore it. And so um, when people draw these energy level diagrams like for SROH, or I drew one for CAOH earlier, um, there's this sort of ground 0, 0, 0, non-vibrating state, and then there's a ladder of MO stretch modes, 1, 0, 0, 2, 0, 0, 3, 0, 0. There's a ladder of vibrational states, um, <clears throat> you know, 0, 1, 0, 0, 2, 0, where you have various possible values of L for some of them that split them. Um, but then you have these like combinations where you have like one stretch, one bend, et cetera. These are kind of the relevant ones. The OH, you know, new three is again irrelevant, so people just kind of ignore it. For these molecules, OH stretch modes are not in general uh, irrelevant, but they are here. Um, <clears throat> and you get, a, there's a very similar conceptual idea of like potential energy surface overlap in these molecules, the excited potential energy surface and ground potential energy surface overlap very well, except now it's more complicated because it's a multi-dimensional thing. And for something like this, where you have basically two relevant degrees of freedom, you can sort of draw a surface, but these can rapidly become sort of multi-dimensional, um, hard to visualize things. But yeah, you know, conceptually it's still like, do they overlap? And yeah, for CaOH, for example, they overlap pretty well. Sorry? Q, Qs are these two modes here. This is the bending angle, basically the bending coordinate and then the stretch coordinate for, for this plot, yeah. Again, because those are the kind of two relevant ones. Yeah. <clears throat> you can do um, sort of simple estimates, meaning kind of multi-dimensional versions of what the homework is. The homework is a one-dimensional thing. Um, <clears throat> you can do similar extensions to multi-dimensions. It's complicated because like um, even these bases don't have to overlap in ground and like when you only have one direction, like the ground and the excited sort of uh, stretching direction and the diatomic are always, they're the same. But here like the bases don't have, don't necessarily overlap. So it's just like, eh, it's, it's just more complicated. Um, but there are things like, you know, the sharp Rosenstock method and GF matrices and other things, which I write down in case you're curious and you want to look them up that allow you to like look up constants and estimate what the vibrational branching is in multiple dimensions. Um, you can also, if you're doing ab initio calculations, there are packages like easy FCF, which like let you calculate these, you know, from your quantum chemistry program output, um, like from QChem. <coughs> so, uh, <coughs> okay. So it's, so, so far this has all been like, they look fairly similar. So now I'll talk about where they start to differ. They being polyatomic versus diatomic. Um, <clears throat> uh, and this is something I'd, that we talked about earlier. <clears throat> In this picture here, um, for those of you who know about like molecular point groups, you know, doesn't matter if you know what that is or not. C infinity V just means it's like a linear molecule with cylindrical symmetry. Like CA, CAOH, they're just all in a line in the ground state. Um, <clears throat> but for excited states, it turns out it's more complicated. Um, <clears throat> so uh, if you look at, so this is going back to the like, where'd the two states go, you know, for the, when I, aha, here we go, yeah, I don't know, this one. It's like, you're mixing two states, where'd the two states go? Here are the two states. It's basically like sort of degenerate pot P orbitals, sort of, 
right? You get like a pi x and a pi y, and they're, you know, they're nominally degenerate um, in a linear molecule. But now if you take this ligand and you start bending it, now this, whether it's like this or this, you would not expect those to be degenerate anymore, right? Is the ligand bending in plane or out of plane, um, the nodal plane. So now in a linear molecule, these are basically degenerate. In a, in a bent molecule, they're super duper far apart. Um, and in something that's a little bit bent, they're a little bit far apart. Um, <clears throat> so the lower symmetry, the fact that in a polyatomic molecule, you at least always have states of lower symmetry. Um, you have to think about things like this, these states splitting. For example, the interaction between the two lobes of an electronic pi state, which is sort of like an electronic p state in a molecule, um, interacting with this bending ligand, which breaks the symmetry. <clears throat> and uh, so not only does this break some symmetry, but this is effectively a coupling between the electron and the molecular degrees of freedom, which remember we were trying to avoid. But now if I take this molecule and I start bending it, it starts interacting with the electron cloud. And that's like, that's not good for this, for photon cycling. It means there's some coupling between uh, the electron and the, and the bond. <clears throat> And that had the consequences of that are um, so in the in the harmonic approximation, so meaning just kind of treating all of these things as like harmonic oscillators. Um, it turns out there's a selection rule that you that you can't change L, this angular momentum projection on the internuclear axis of the vibration, um, and that's sort of intuitively because in that harmonic approximation, the electron and the geometry of the molecule are like decoupled and so there's no coupling between them so they they don't talk to each other you know and when you excite like <clears throat> you know say you excite an electron or something um you can't really change the vibration um which is where l is coming from um however if you have this issue i just talked about so you have a state for example where the electron angular momentum is not zero so you get something like these lobes these pi type lobes you lose cylindrical symmetry, and now there is a coupling between these two things. So for example, you get couplings between a doublet pi non-vibrating state and a doublet sigma uh, bending state. So in other words, the, the angular momentum from the electron, which is this pi, can hop to the ligand. <clears throat> um, so, this, so, the L, so this goes from sort of L equals 1 to L equals 0 for the electron, and then L equals 0 to L equals 1 for the angular momentum of the ligand. So you get some coupling between these two things now. And so um, you sort of, you, you don't get this selection rule in, in real molecules, sadly. Or it's, in a, you know, it's an approximate selection rule, meaning it's like, ah, eh, it's typically not very big. Um, <clears throat> uh, this these type of effects have like 50 different names. Um, but I think the most, maybe the most common ones are direct vibronic coupling or Renner Teller interaction, um, but they also have tons of other names. And so that means if I look at some, if I look at this state here, <clears throat> which is sort of like the, the analog of the excited pi state in calcium fluoride, like it's not vibrating, you know, it's just, it just looks very much like it. Um, these vibronic effects and also sort of higher order effects, including spin orbit, mix in states that have some bending character. And so this beautiful sort of excited non-bending state actually has some bending type character and therefore has some coupling between the electron and the molecular degrees of freedom, um, which, you, which you don't want. Just as a side question, uh, would it be possible for the, in the absence of an external potential, but in the presence of uh, sort of multiple molecules, like in a gas or so, at relatively high temperature, not a few Kelvin, for uh, vibrational transitions to excite electronic transitions. So the other way of what you uh, So in these, in, in these types of states where you have electronic orbital angular momentum and the possibility of vibrational angular momentum, it turns out that those can be so strongly coupled that there's almost no distinction between the states. Um, <clears throat> so what, so 
Um, and I, I don't think I, I don't think I, I might have a slide about this in here later, I can't remember. If not, I have one in a different talk I can dig up. Um, this state, like these electronic states where you have, say, pi and bending, and there, so therefore you have sort of like a big L and a little L, it's actually split into like four states of the different orientations of big L and little L, and they are very, they can be very strongly mixed together. So it's like you almost can't distinguish them in, in many cases. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if that answered, if that was exactly what you were asking, but yeah. Okay. <clears throat> uh, so these type of effects are the, uh, the things that must be understood with high accuracy and precision to kind of understand photon cycling in molecules to the level that, you, you know, that we care about in the community these days. Um, <clears throat> but you know, luckily, uh, thanks to the, work, the hard work of quantum chemists, um, we can do this these days. Um, <clears throat> this is something I was, we were talking about in the, in the break that I'll kind of repeat, that um, in some sense, for these linear triatomics, I would argue that from like a physics standpoint, we completely understand the molecule. Like we know, we know the sort of quantum numbers of every state and the relative orientations of everything. And like what are the interactions? What are the couplings? What are the decay pathways? We sort of know on the fully quantum level, not ignoring any degrees of freedom. And uh, that's only as of the last couple years. Um, and for linear triatomics, that is the state of the art. Um, so anything more than that, there are kind of open questions. So even something like CaCH3, um, you know, which or, or CaNH2, which has four atoms, which is only one more than three. Um, all of this stuff for something like that is actually not worked out yet. So, um, <clears throat> but we and others are working on it. Um, <clears throat> but for th for linear triatomics, at least, it's like basically a solved problem at this point. Um, theoretically, experimentally, it still, you know, barely works. Um, <clears throat> and so you can, taking into account all of these effects, like these vibronic couplings and spin orbit and this and that, um, you can model the branching ratios in a real molecule um, in a way that, ver that matches experiment very well. So here, this is calcium OH um, decays from the excited pi state down to the ground state and saying if you start in the non-vibrating excited state, what's the probability that you end up in some ground vibrational state? Um, and you can see this is a log scale, you know, so it goes, that shouldn't be 10 to the minus 3. Um, I don't know what happened with, with that. That should be like 10 to the minus, you know, 0, but I'll fix that. <clears throat> um, uh, so, uh, you have almost, again, this, if you ignore that, if you shift all the exponents by three, um, uh, you almost always end up in the non-vibrating ground state, which is, you know, what you expect. It's like 97% or something. Um, and then it goes sort of exponentially, you know, geometrically downward. Um, the next most, the most likely place you decay to is the one quantum of CAO stretch, which kind of makes sense. Like you're exciting the calcium. You expect things connected to the calcium to be excited. Um, and then, <clears throat> and you'll notice that for these two sort of dominant decay channels, the harmon, all of these different methods like overlap exactly. Like meaning the harmonic approximation is basically within experimental and theoretical uncertainties to these fancy models. But as you go to higher and higher, uh, less and less likely, uh, decays, the discrepancies between the, the theory and the experiment, or the harmonic approximation and the experiment start to uh, get pretty bad. So for higher, for the stretch modes, it's kind of always not so bad. Like even 200, 300, the harmonic and experiment are like, eh, they're within a factor of a few. It's not, it's not that bad. Um, but for something like the bend mode, which the harmonic approximation predicts you'll never, is forbidden, eh, it's actually on the, again, <laughs> Uh, it's actually on the kind of few times 10 to the minus 3 level um, uh, that it actually shows up. Um, <clears throat> but if you include these sort of multiple states and multiple perturbations, 
which is this red. Red is kind of the state of the art theory, and then black is experiment. Um, you can see that they eh, they overlap pretty well. And so if you if you convert this into a sort of more experimentally motivated number, which is how many photons can I scatter with n lasers, where n is limited by you know practicalities. Um, if and as so this is here, I'm saying you add pump just pump just this or pump this and this or pump these or pump these. So this is kind of sequentially adding these repump lasers to address these different leakage channels, um, <clears throat> which is kind of the you know most important diagnostic in some sense. Um, you know, modern theory can predict, uh, can basically, you know, agree with experiment to kind of a factor of two or something, which is, which is pretty good. Um, whereas the harmonic approximation would tend to overestimate the number of photons that you can scatter. Um, as always, the imperfections make everything worse. <clears throat> Any questions about this? So do you have an idea for what would be the next missing contribution to their calculations to match all these tiny differences that are remaining? Like oh, how to improve them further? Oh, um, <clears throat> I would say that's a good question. I don't know. You could imagine just including like higher order couplings. You know, this goes up to like second order in these sort of vibronic and spin orbit couplings, and if you go to higher order, eh, maybe it'll get even better. Um, but uh, I don't know if that's what's limiting it, or is it just like how accurately can you compute the potential energy surface, or how accurately can you, you know, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> My guess would yeah. be electron correlation starts to be significantly a problem for your accuracy. Yeah, yeah, that's a good, yeah, electron correlation. Um, yeah, for certain things, yeah, for some species, for like, <laughs> for CAOH, it's not so bad. But for things like YBOH, the electron correlations are like big. And they are definitely the limiting factor there. So yeah, I think that's a good, that's a good point. That might be what's kind of limiting these eventually, um, is just, yeah, treating these as sort of approximately, basically ignoring that filled shell of electron, or not ignoring it, but treating it with increasing levels of sophistication. Um, gets you know harder and harder, yeah. But also, um, this this level for, again for these for these linear triatomics, it's basically like good enough um, because once you get to this level of precision, you start to run into just other issues like the laser technology. Like, how hard is it to get these other lasers? What's the probability that they will all be running at the same time? So. Um, the, the theory, this is, yeah, I think the improving the theory on this is for these specific things is probably like, also, um, you'll, know, <laughs> you'll notice that the error bars on the experiment are, for many of these, just overlapping with the theory. So it's like, at some point, you're just limited by your ability to measure these in the first place. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, experimentally, how can you distinguish between those modes, like, do Modulate the frequency or? They're, uh, they're different, they're far enough away in energy that you just sort of tune your laser to look at one or the other, or realistically buy a different laser. Actually, I will say something about how you can resolve these different modes. But yeah, these, these are all spaced by like tens of ter like 10 terahertz or something. They're very far apart. So they're very, very easy to resolve. <clears throat> So there's a, this is sort of getting to, this will partially address the question of like, you know, why would you bother going to a more complicated species? Um, they have neat features that aren't present in the simpler ones. That's the short answer. And here's one of those. Here's one of those neat features. Um, so just to, <clears throat> to remind you, oh yeah, there's that thing I think, I probably should have had this on the earlier slide. Just to remind you, this bending mode is doubly degenerate. Um, there's at least some way to parametrize the states where you have like angular momentum around the symmetry axis, <coughs> um, which is quantized by L, where L goes um, from, uh, well, yeah, from plus nu two to minus nu two, or the absolute value goes from nu two to zero in steps of two, not one. Um, <coughs> and uh, these are actually, oh yeah, so earlier I had said these are not eigenstates of 
time or parity reversal, time reversal or parity reversal symmetry. Um, this is the same as the single electron, you know, lowercase pi orbital I was talking about. <clears throat> if you look at this and you reverse the flow of time, it's, now it's spinning in a different direction. Or if you look at the mirror image of this, it's spinning in a different dire direction. So these, are, these states are not eigenstates of time reversal or parity symmetry. And that usually is a hint that, um, that you're missing something because the, uh, the physical eigenstates should respect these symmetries. Um, <clears throat> and so the physical eigenstate, that gives you a hint that the physical eigenstates are superpositions of these because you can see the P and T, parity and time reversal, sort of interchange them. So if you take a superposition of them, then they will be eigenstates of parity and time reversal. Um, <clears throat> So the, eigen, the physical eigenstates are superpositions. Yes? I have a question about the last slide. Um, does the like mu1, mu2 is a number? Because I don't know like how to mu2 minus 2 and like mu2 will be larger or equal to 0. Yeah, it's a, it's a number that counts the vibrational quanta in the bending mode. So it's an integer that goes from you know, 0 to some number before the molecule becomes unbound. And then how do you like get the number? What do you mean? Like in the, like how do you tell which state it's in? Or yeah. like experimentally, these states, like whether it's in, you know, new two equals zero or one or two, those are split by, by, by vibrational energies. And so you can just oh. basically do some sort of energy resolve spectroscopy and figure out which state it's in. Yeah, is that what you, is that, was, does that address the question? Okay. <clears throat> Any other questions? Yeah, so the physical eigenstates exactly analogous, you know, not coincidentally, exactly analogous to this like single electron pi orbital thing. Um, the physical eigenstates are superpositions, even in odd superpositions. Um, <clears throat> And so if you look at, oh, I steal the figure. There it is again. Sorry, you still can't. I can see them on my laptop, but yeah, you still can't see. There's a light gray lobe, symmetric lobe down here and over here and over here. <clears throat> um, if you look at the wave function of the, like, of the position of this out-of-plane ligand, which is like vibrating around um, or off axis, um, it looks like this or this, right? You get two superpositions. If you add or subtract these, you get like something where it's like cosine phi and sine phi, except now this isn't the electron distribution. This is like the sort of ligand, you know, nuclear distribution. But it splits into these, you know, states with these two sort of 90 degree rota rotated lobes. Um, same as before. <clears throat> but now there's uh, something interesting. This also happens for the electron as well. Um, <clears throat> These are not degenerate. These two states are not degenerate. They're split in energy. If all of these things were degenerate, it wouldn't matter which base. Choose any basis. Any basis is fine if they're degenerate. But this state and this state do not have equal energy. They're split. And the, physically, the physical intuition to understand why they're split is that uh, the molecule has like end over end rotation. So if this is the sort of axis about which the molecule is rotating, this and this have different moments of inertia, like whether the ligand is sort of perpendicular, you know, <clears throat> whether it's basically along or perpendicular to the rotation axis. Uh, those will have different energies because they have different moments of inertia because they have different mass distributions. And so these two are, do not have the same energy. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> so they're split. That's, uh, and, and then that's why these are sort of the physical eigenstates, is because they're the stationary states that have well-defined energy. <clears throat> yeah, that's, that's what I said, but written out in words. Um, you can estimate this just for fun. You can make like a sort of back of the envelope hand wavy, like how big is it? Um, <clears throat> way to think of it. Uh, is when you, slight, when you have the molecule slightly bent, you, you, you now have two different moments of inertia, right? Whether you rotate around this axis or this axis, the moments of inertia are slightly different. Um, and you can make some corny estimates. It's like, well, how, how bent is it? Or like, how displaced is it? It's like, well, if, you know, it's a harmonic oscillator and you know the frequency, so it's displaced by like that much, you know, the oscillator length. 
Um, so that means the moment of inertia differs by you know this much. This is the like the parallel axis theorem or one of those things you learned in first year physics that you thought you'd never use. Um, I was about to say here's a practical application of it, but is this how practical is this really practical? Um, it's useful. Yeah, so you can estimate the moment of inertia difference. Um, and then you can estimate for what's the difference in, say, rotational energy um, <clears throat> by looking up the relationship between rotational energy and moment of inertia. And you would estimate that the energy difference between these two is on the, the rotational energy difference between this and this is on the order of the ratio of the rotational constant, which is B, and the vibrational frequency. And the, this ratio is like about a part in 10 to the minus 3, part per thousand. Um, so you expect um, these two states that I said were split to be split by something like a thousandth of the rotational energy level splitting. So this is more like additional substructure in the rotational level. Um, <clears throat> and uh, given these types of molecules, um, so this is called L doubling, right? Because this quantum number L gives rise to a doublet of two physically distinct states. Um, and this L doubling is typically on the order of like 10 megahertz for these types of molecules versus 10 gigahertz, typical rotational constants for these types of molecules. Um, <clears throat> and this is, what, uh, this is what we would refer to as a parity doublet, a state of closely spaced levels of opposite parity, as opposed to having to go up to the next rotation. So the rotational levels alternate in opposite parity, but those are kind of far apart. Now here, each rotational level is split into a doublet of opposite parity states. So you get a ladder of pairs of opposite rotational states. Um, <clears throat> so that's interesting. Um, if, you, if you're in my area doing like fundamental symmetries research, whenever you see a parity doublet, your heart flutters because that tells you that there's something fun you can do with it. Um, <clears throat> Uh, these types, by the way, you know, these types of arguments are kind of fun and handy, and they give you a good sense for the scale of things. And it turns out you can use these kind of back of the envelope estimates to estimate basically everything in a molecule, like the rotational structure, the spin rotation constants, whatever. Um, but uh, you just always have to be careful that the Details of the structure can change these values significantly. So like, eh, they might give you the sense of scale of how, they, how big they are, but like, eh, you have to be careful. They differ by factors of several um, from each other and from these simple estimates. Um, <clears throat> so why, why are parity doublets interesting? <clears throat> because they make species very, very polarizable. So to... to uh, remind you or introduce you to, if you've never encountered this way of thinking about like, uh, what happens when you put an atom or a molecule in an electric field? Um, atoms and molecules in, in zero field, they always have, their orbitals are always symmetric. They never have a preferred direction in free space. Um, so like an S orbital, for example, obviously has no preferred direction. You know, P orbital, you might think like, oh, that has a preferred direction. But not really, because if you square the wave function, the electron spends as much time up here as down here. So there's still no, there's maybe a preferred orientation, but there's no preferred direction. <clears throat> and that's always true. Um, but if you add an electric field, you can mix these two states, which have opposite parity. You know, this is parity even, this is parity odd. If I flip it in a mirror, the sort of signs of the lobes change. If I mix states with opposite parity, then I can get something like this, where they're clearly is a preferred direction, like the electron is spending more time up here than down here. <clears throat> so that means it has like an electric dipole moment. It has like sort of a charge separation in some direction. <clears throat> um, so in order to do that, in order to mix these two states, um, if you've encountered you know, perturbation theory and quantum mechanics, um, that tells you that in order to mix these two states, you have to apply an electric field sort of large enough to overcome the energy splitting between these two states. Um, <clears throat> this is an induced dipole, by the way. And yeah, so as an aside, um, which is, you know, borderline on a rant, um, nothing has a permanent electric dipole moment. So in like chemistry textbooks and even quantum mechanics textbooks, they talk about like, oh, the permanent electric dipole moment of water um, or like NH3 um, or like the hydrogen atom in the N equals 2 levels. 
Um, those don't actually have permanent electrodiode moments. They have induced dipole moments, always. Um, <clears throat> so meaning that if you, uh, a, per, a permanent electrodiode moment would have a linear shift in electric field versus energy all the way down to zero. But if you take any of these actual physical systems and you measure uh, the energy splitting or the energy shifts, they always roll off into a quadratic regime at low field, which is indicative of an induced dipole. So they all have induced dipoles. They don't ever have permanent dipoles. And I'm, I'm happy to go on an angry rant over lunch if you, if you want to fight me about that, because I will, I, will I will fight you about that, and I will win. Um, <clears throat> anyway, um, except for you know, exotic, permanent electrodive moments can exist um, and they're predicted to exist, but they only exist from like exotic symmetry violating high energy physics. So, which is kind of the, you know, I threw that in because this is like basically the, the research that I focus on in my lab is like that kind of stuff. That's why I also feel so passionately about it. Um, <clears throat> so, um, to go into the, to, to dig into the math a little bit more about like this, <clears throat> um, if you have, if you consider a two-level system, um, which, hey, you learned about those. Um, if you have a two-level system, uh, a ground in an excited state with some energy splitting, and you say those two states are coupled by an electric field, meaning the electric field can mix them like this, um, then the Hamiltonian um, would look like, well, I guess there would be an energy split, in there, or, or the, the Hamiltonian of the interaction, you know, the dipole dot electric field, would add basically off diagonal terms because it would mix these two states. Um, <clears throat> the on diagonal terms, here I'm meaning diagonal like on the matrix, not the Frank Condon factor um, stuff. The on diagonal terms of the Hamiltonian are zero because these states, regardless of what they are, they always have well defined parity. Um, and so, and because the dipole operator is position odd operator. Um, if you write this out, it ends, you're integrating over an odd function, and so it's always zero. So the diagonal is zero, uh, the off di but you get an off diagonal term that mixes these two states. Um, never mind that, that's just a bunch of definitions that are not that important. Um, so the Hamiltonian, the total Hamiltonian, is therefore we get some off diagonal coupling between these two states, and then we get an on, there's an on diagonal just energy shift just from the fact that these two energy, these two states have different energy, which I'm defining as delta. Um, so then this is a two by two Hamiltonian, so even I can diagonalize that, even on like with pencil and paper, um, but you find you get two energies that look like plus or minus, you know, something, and it's plus or minus this. Um, the energy splitting times this function, uh, one plus four eta squared square root, where eta is the ratio of the electrostatic interaction, like d times e, um, dipole moment times electric field, divided by the energy splitting. So it's the ratio of the strength of the perturbation you've applied with the electric field and the energy splitting between the states. Um, and then now you can just plot this and look at limits. In the high field limit, where the electric field is like very, very, very large, um, <clears throat> your energies just look like this. They asymptotically approach just linear energy shifts that look like d dot e plus d e and minus d e. So it looks like a permanent electric dipole, um, which is what leads to often the confusion about whether they have permanent dipoles or not. Um, <clears throat> and uh, now these eigenstates are states like this where the sort of molecule is oriented like up or down. Like the molecule ori is like either oriented up or down. Um, at low fields, you're in this quadratic limit. You get quadratic energy shifts like an induced dipole. And now the eigenstates are well described by these superpositions of, you know, that I was talking about earlier, like up plus down. Um, <clears throat> so you get, so here you can think of it as like a mixture of these polarized states. Or here you can think of it as a, as a mixture of these parity eigenstates. <clears throat> um, so, the takeaway is that you need eta of order one. So meaning you need the electrostatic interaction d times e to be on the order of the energy splitting to realize sort of appreciable polarization, meaning sort of appreciable transition between this quadratic induced and linear polarized limit. <clears throat> and uh, 
This poll, yes. Well, maybe. I'm from the quantum information science part, so really I can't understand. This is how you will apply this for the quantum information part, that like you're going to associate one of these states to the zero, one of these states to the one. Kind, yeah, sort of. So this, I guess the, where I, what I'm getting at with this is, um, <clears throat> well, from, a, from a quantum information standpoint, one of the interesting things about molecules is that they have dipole moments which interact. But <clears throat> according to what I'm talking about here, they don't interact unless you polarize them. Right? If you have an unpolarized molecule, it sort of doesn't have a preferred dipole direction. And so in order to get strong interactions between dipoles, you have to polarize them. Um, and these states, uh, well, the, sort of the next slide is that these states, when you have parity doublets, this energy splitting is much smaller. And so you can polarize them in much smaller fields. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So do you mind explaining again why the odd diagonal terms of the dipole moment is zero? <clears throat> yeah, so, um, so the dipole operator is, is the position operator times the electron charge. Right? It's like you know, charge times distance. And the position operator is, is a parity odd operator. So if you think of it in terms of like coordinate space, like just write the wave function out as you know, a function of R. Um, if you have either GG or EE, the on diagonal, you take the absolute value squared which is an even function, and then you multiply it by r, because that's in there, sandwiched in there, which is an odd function. So you're integrating over an odd function, and so it's zero. So I noticed you say that because these states have well-defined parity, but what if uh, your molecule doesn't have that symmetry? It does. It always does. They always do. In free, in free space, they absolutely always do. And this relates to this, this thing that I you know, made the ominous threats that I'll fight you over. Um, not an intellectual fight, not an actual fight. Um, yeah, those states never exist in, in molecules. What happens is this energy splitting can be so low that it's basically irrelevant, um, but it's actually always there. So you never have, again, except in the presence of like exotic physics. So like the weak nuclear force, for example, can mix opposite parity states by a very, very small amount um, and things like that. But you're in free space, you, the atomic and molecular eigenstates always have that symmetry. But say you have a molecule of C1 symmetry, then all the states are going to be A. And then I will argue that if G and G are both A and dipole is A, then it is not symmetry forbidden. Like the, it, it's, that, that's, that, 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 this symmetry is rigorously conserved. Because any, any sort of apparent violations always involve some lifting of some sort of things that look like degeneracies that are not actually degeneracies and are lifted. Yeah, because so, yeah, because uh, it's <clears throat> it's always true, always, always, yeah. <clears throat> um, Can I also ask something? Yeah. Uh, what you call E here is this always some like external field, or can it also be something like internal? Because if I think about like my uh, high school chemistry, I was taught <coughs> that you know water has a yeah moment because of the yeah you're you're. Your teacher lied to you. Um, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so like water has a permanent electric dive moment in its internal frame. But that internal frame is rotating. And it always averages to zero in the lab frame. Always. Uh, and so does every other molecule. Again, except in the presence of like weird, like the uh, W and Z boson exchanges in the nucleus can mix opposite parity states and things like that, like wacky stuff. But it's, uh, it's very tiny. So you have, you're not frozen the molecule, you're saying you're allowing it to freely rotate. Yeah, free space. That free space is important. Yeah, if you take something and like freeze it in a matrix, it's like, okay, now it's like pointing that way. Because you've kind of broken the symmetry by putting it in an environment that has a preferred direction. But in free space, in the absence of fields, that you always have this symmetry. Guaranteed. <clears throat> and yeah, and so this is why, um, uh, 
Yeah, so this is why parity doublets are neat, because you always have to overcome the energy splitting between opposite parity states to polarize something, including molecules. When you have opposite parity states that are squished really close together, that means it makes them super polarizable. Um, so for example, something like a diatomic doublet sigma, like calcium fluoride. Um, this plot's actually for ytterbium fluoride, but it's, they're basically all the same. You need something like 10 kilovolts per centimeter to get kind of order unity alignment. So here the blue is like, um, would be like a diatomic, like a fluoride. Technically, it's the, as plotted, it's the non-vibrating triatomic, but the non-vibrating triatomic is indistinguishable from the diatomic. Um, you need, you know, in something like 10 kilovolts per centimeter, you can get sort of appreciable polarization, whereas in something with these parity doublets, you get that same level of polarization in like 100 volts per centimeter. Um, <clears throat> and uh, that's very useful um, because the types of applications that I do, but also for like quantum information applications, you want to polarize the dipoles so they can interact with each other, so you can do stuff with them. And uh, with these polyatomic molecules, that's one of the unique features they have, is you can polarize them and access their dipoles at, with, at very low fields. <clears throat> uh, just as an aside, if you have molecules in a pi or a delta state, it turns out those also have doublets that look almost exactly like this. But then you don't get that beautiful, this sort of nice S plus P sigma hybridization that pushes the electron away. It doesn't really happen in those molecules. It's, very, it's hard to cycle photons in those molecules at those ground states, although not impossible. Um, but it's kind of uh, being investigated actively. <clears throat> yeah, and so the polarization, well, you know, who cares? The polarization gives you access to the dipole, and the dipole is one of the things that molecules have which atoms do not have, um, which, gi which gives you some access to some interesting physics. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> so let's see. So there's, um, uh, maybe I'll skip this part, because I think this is just another, uh, this is another way to think about what I was just talking about in terms of looking at projections of angular momenta on the axis. But I'll just, I'll say the punchline, which is that you get these doublets anytime you have a situation where you have a non-zero projection of an orbital angular momentum on the symmetry axis. Whether that comes from the electron or from this type of vibration or like a rigid, rigid body rotation, um, you always get these doublets. But I'll just, I'll just, ta I'll just say that punchline and, uh, and move on. Um, <clears throat> there was, a, I thought I saw a question. So is the dipole, is it just the electronic car or is the electronic car plus the nuclear car? Uh, it's just, it's the total dipole. But in this case, it arises mostly from the electron charge distribution. So like if you have the like, nuclear R also, right? Will there still be no more permanent dipole uh, if you look at just the electronic wave functions? Because, of course, like the electronic R is going to make it cancel out, but the nuclear R will not be interacting on the electronic subspace. So then that leaves uh, just electron-electron overlap. So permanent dipole will no longer be seen. Right, um, but the nuclear coordinates are not well-defined in the lab frame. They're in a frame that's rotating, and that rotation will always average its position to zero. It's sort of analogous to, um, you know, if you look at like, like this, you know, like just the regular old S and P orbitals, right? It's like those arise from a point like electron orbiting a point like proton. And so you're like, oh, obviously there's a dipole moment because there's like a charge separation. But you know, they're not static point particles, you know, in the hydrogen atom or any atom. They occupy some wave function. Uh, <clears throat> you know, so you could, the, the electron is sort of orbiting around the, the proton. And it always orbits around in a way so that it's symmetric and has no preferred direction. And it's kind of the same thing with a molecule, right? If you look at, like, rotational wave functions of a molecule, which are, you know, more complicated than this, they actually kind of look like this. They always average around so they have average away so they have no preferred direction. Always. 
Um, yeah. Um, <clears throat> and kind of for the same sort of intuitive reasons why the, you know, why atoms don't have it, one. So in other words, the kind of, uh, the reason that the electronic R goes away, the sort of nuclear R goes away too, they all go, everything goes away. It always averages away in free space. Yeah. It just as sort of a follow-up comment to the water question, uh, this teacher didn't exactly lie for practical considerations that the boundary effects of any container of water would kind of force a polarization to spread through the hydrogen bonding between molecules. So, uh, the, what I'm saying is that the ensemble averaging does not take out the polarization, only the sort of time averaging of a single molecule. But that's not in free space. All, all bets are off when you are not in free space anymore. Oh. So like, it's like if you take a salt crystal, like a salt crystal can just like sit there and be polarized, and it's like, that doesn't violate any symmetries. It's just, but it's, you know, you've kind of broken the symmetry because that's not like a free single molecule. And I guess, strictly speaking, if you, <laughs> that static crystal is not in its emotional ground state, but so maybe that's a bad example. Um, but yeah, something like in a container or on a surface, like uh, you no longer have, it's not free space, you've broken the symmetry because you have, you know, your surface has a preferred direction or something like that. So yeah. uh, how do you observe <clears throat> this experimentally? So, yeah, so for example, this, um, I used to have a plot I, I used to spend more time ranting about this, but and so I could probably dig up the plots. But like, um, you can look up stark measurements in water. Like people have taken gas phase water molecules and measured their energy shifts as a function of electric fields, and it looks exactly like this. It never goes linearly to zero. And so this is that's the sort of that's an observable. Is just like if you plot the energy versus E field, is it linear down to zero or does it roll off into a into a quadratic at low field? <clears throat> and uh, you know it always does this, including for water, and it has been measured. <clears throat> so yeah, so but yeah, so the comment I made earlier that it's just for a lot of, a lot of circumstances, the thing this field is so low that it's just like practically always polarized. So like who cares? Just say it as a permanent dipole, you know. Um, but in reality, you have to polarize it. Um, and that gives you, and so for you know for these types of species, the fact that you can access that dipole with lower field um, gives you advantages because the dipole is kind of one of the interesting things about a molecule that an atom doesn't have. <clears throat> but yeah, we should we should talk about this over lunch because I, I I even have like I can give references and stuff about the no dipole, including like written by chemists. Like they go to one of the best papers, like arguing like, yes, seriously, nothing has a permanent dipole moment is from like a bunch of chemists um, who frame it in sort of more in who frame it in terms of like point groups and symmetries and things. It's just like it, it is abs it is it is in fact true. Um, but again, for most situations you don't care, but for something like where you want to fully access the quantum levels, like because you want to make the dipoles interact in a controlled way or something, like you then that stuff becomes really important. And then there become very dramatic distinctions between like these different types of species and what fields they get polarized in and things like that. <clears throat> so yeah, so your high school chemistry teacher didn't lie to you. They just, they swept a lot of de details which for most people are unimportant under the rug. So <clears throat> yeah, so um, cool. <clears throat> so now, um, I'm going to start shifting a little bit towards talking about some ways that these things are sort of implemented and realized. Um, actually, I'll say one more thing um, related to um, the sort of electromagnetic control. Um, <clears throat> the interaction of these types of molecules with external electric and magnetic fields is very complicated, um, but in a way that turns out to be useful. And there's another. Um, <clears throat> There's a term in the Hamiltonian, so there's the regular old like you know spin dot b, dipole dot e, whatever. But there's also this in these types of polyatomics. There's this very weird term, um, which don't exist in diatomics, where it's like electron spin dotted with l, this angular momentum of the ligand around the axis. And the intuitive reason for again the sort of back of the envelope hand wavy thing is that, well, this thing's orbiting around, it's charged, it makes a magnetic field, and that magnetic field interacts with the electron. 
which, which has a magnetic moment. So you get some coupling between these. Um, it turns out that this is about something like 10 megahertz, you know, in frequency units. Um, <clears throat> and uh, this is handy um, because by changing the electric field that you apply to the molecule, you can change its sort of orientation in the lab frame. But because the electron spin is coupled to this internal frame, you're also changing the orientation of the electron on the lab frame. So you can sort of tune the magnetic and electric properties of the molecule um, by, applying a different, by applying external fields. Um, <clears throat> and that's something I'll, um, I'll sort of, I'll, sh I'll say something more about later. So if you make a plot of what is the sort of the Zeeman shift, basically the magnetic moment of, the mo of, uh, of these molecules in some units versus electric field. So this looks kind of similar to a plot I showed before where it was like a stark shift versus electric field. This is sort of sensitivity to magnetic fields versus electric field. Um, it actually has this complicated shape where in the low field, um, the dipoles are unaligned, the spins are sort of unaligned, but in the high electric field limit, the dipoles are quantized, the spins are quantized along the dipole, and so you get sort of a dramatic change in the magnetic behavior. Um, <clears throat> and uh, there's a, the, you know, why is this interesting? Well, um, it turns out if you want to do like quantum control things with these types of molecules, their magnetic sensitivity is a huge limitation. It's a big, it's like a big problem. Uh, however, um, if you sit, you'll notice these cross zero. Um, because they transition between these two regimes, they cross zero. So there are, there are values of the electric field where you make the magnetic sensitivity vanish. Um, and uh, intuitively, you can think of that as you've aligned, you've partially aligned uh, the dipole and therefore this internal magnetic field of the, electro of the molecule such that the electron spin is always perpendicular to the lab frame. So, it always, so it's sort of rapidly rotating around and averaging out. Um, <clears throat> but I'll, I'll, sh I'll, sh I'll show some more information about this and how it connects to things like you know, coherence and stuff later. But yeah. Uh, can you build like a CNOT gate or like something, like a quantum gate using like dipole dipole interactions? Because I see that people have done try and try to do that. I mean, like it's gonna be cheaper than actually doing a superconducting device. Uh -huh. Like using like these dipole dipole interaction to actually. Like, sure. Yeah, and I'll I'll actually show something about that later. It, uh, show some data, not from my group, um, but from someone else's group. But it's recently people have started using molecules to do these types of you know gates and interactions, um, and I personally am very excited about that for the science applications that you can do uniquely with molecules like fundamental chemistry or this like fundamental nuclear particle physics that you kind of, you can't do that with anything else. Like those are sort of intrinsic physical things of the molecule that you have to use the molecule to study. And those types of quantum operations will allow access to things like, you know, quantum measurement and quantum enhanced metrology for these types of physics. Um, but in terms of giving like a comparison of like, if you're trying to make a quantum computer, would you use like an array of neutral molecules or superconducting qubits? You know, I would ask someone else because I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to make a quantum computer because um, it sounds really hard. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of those ideas, like the sort of what would you want to do to do that? If you you can do those same things to do other, you can do those those same ideas and techniques to do like quantum sensing and quantum measurement and quantum metrology. Um, so yeah. So I think I got lost a little bit in the transition from the electric to magnetic properties. So would you mind to go again for over the vectors that are in here and what makes them, again, what makes this magnetic response vanish? Yeah, it's because you can think of it as uh, this electron spin is sort of processing around this internuclear axis because of this like internal magnetic field. <clears throat> and the electric dipole this internal axis is processing around the laboratory electric field. And so as you change the laboratory electric field, you change the dipole orientation, but that also means you sort of change the electron spin orientation because it's sort of 
locked to the internal frame. And so there's some particular angle where it's basically rotating in a plane perpendicular to the lab frame. Um, so it's, yeah. it saves from magnetic fields along one particular dimension or all, all the lab frame directions? Uh, <clears throat> good question. Um, from in principle, from only the direction along the electric field. However, you're also insensitive to transverse fields because there are sort of energy splittings between the different states that you would need to couple from like the sort of opposite Zeeman shifted states. Um, so it turns out, so you get sort of gigantic insensitivity along the electric field. And for perpendicular, you're sort of, you have like quadratic sensitivity up until you get to the point where the magnetic field overcomes the energy splitting between like the spin rotation states. But that turns out to be pretty large. So it's like, practically speaking, you're insensitive in all directions. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I'll skip, oh, that's the wrong button. Um, I'll skip these two slides, just some of the details of like symmetric tops and, anti and asymmetric tops. Um, they just have some additional subtleties that people haven't fully worked out. Um, but, you know, ask me later if you're curious. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about um, some experimental implementations of these things um, that I've been talking about. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, how do you make molecules? Um, good question. So one thing you can do is just take some solid and, or gas phase molecules. You can just take a solid and boil it. Um, that works. Um, but the problem is um, that uh, because molecules have all these internal degrees of freedom, when you boil them and you heat them up, you'll populate a huge number of internal states in the molecule. Um, <clears throat> and uh, in particular, like rotational is especially bad because the kind of energy splittings of rotational levels are on the order of like a Kelvin. So in a 1,000 Kelvin oven or something, you've got a lot of rotational states. Um, <clears throat> so it's useful to cool to a few Kelvin so that you freeze out the uh, at least a lot of the rotational structure. So um, here's, for example, a direct comparison of some optical spectrum of some molecule, um, naphthalene, at room temperature versus at 2 Kelvin in a supersonic jet. And it goes from being just like a smudge to like individual like quantum states in the, in the molecule that you can resolve and therefore control and access. So cool to a few Kelvin first. Um, <clears throat> one of the most common starting points for these are called cryogenic buffer gas beams, of which there are several right here at UCLA. Um, <clears throat> uh, these molecules that I've been talking about, like these alkaline earth fluorides and hydroxides, they're free radicals. They're super reactive. Like they react instantly with everything. And so you kind of have to make them in situ. Um, and so what you do is you use uh, an inert gas in a cryogenic environment. So um, there are kind of many variations on this, but you basically take some copper box, cool it to a few Kelvin, fill it with helium, one of the few things these won't react with. Um, you have some solid precursor that you vaporize with a, with a laser. So you get some hot molecules. They collide with the helium and cool. <clears throat> and then you can sort of ex you can extract them, for example, in a beam and shoot them to some other part of your experiment to do something with them. <clears throat> um, and uh, you can do this for basically anything. You can use these beams directly for spectroscopy and precision measurements, or you can use these as a first step for laser cooling and trapping, and then quantum control. So the molecule gas phase molecules um, that have been used for quantum control. Some of them were created this way. Some were created a different way I won't talk about. <clears throat> so, I'm question. So, since, since the radicals might be, uh, the, maybe, the, uh, maybe the localized to maybe somewhere, so how do you uh, try to control that to the, those molecules you get maybe from the combination of the radicals is the design of what you, you want. All the, uh, all the radicals uh, you create is, has you Unique structure. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, when you do something like this, um, oh, you create all sorts of stuff. You create what you, a bunch of things you do want, but a bunch of things you don't want. And you just rely on the fact that 
if you use like laser spectroscopy or any other form of spectroscopy at low temperatures, it's sort of very easy to resolve different molecules from each other, assuming you already know what their structure is. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, you need to separate them. No, you, d you, you don't have to. So you can just, there are kind of two approaches. <laughs> um, you're right, if they're sort of colliding it with each other, that could be a problem. Um, if you just let this, if you make, if you expand this beam into a vacuum, the density will drop to the point where they stop colliding with each other. And so they kind of just spatially separate. If you want to load a trap or something, it which I'll talk about, the trapping is always very species selective. In, in fact, it's like single quantum state within a species selective. So your trap just like doesn't work for anything except that one thing. So you never kind of get the wrong thing okay, in the so, so that afterwards we still have some kind of strategies to maybe just divide everything. Yeah. yeah, and it's more just like ignoring it. It's you, you just ignore everything else because it turns out that you, people actually, if you want to say do something like observe collisions between them, or it's actually really hard. These things tend to be very dilute. So they kind of are non-interacting almost for free. You have to try very hard to get them to interact. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, so um, that's just like a picture of, uh, of what one looks like. Um, we have a few of these in my lab. There are several of these at, here at UCLA. This is one from Harvard that I just thought was a nice, nice looking picture. Um, and here are just some kind of properties of the beam, which maybe I'll, I'll skip over. Um, there are many variations on these as well. Um, <clears throat> If you want to uh, actually make these molecules, it's sort of like a it's, a, it's a fine art of like, okay, what do you vaporize to get what you want? Um, and uh, so usually we take some solid precursor, not always, and you vaporize it and you get some gas phase, whatever you want. And uh, there's this sort of empirical rule which we live by, which is if you take some solid containing various atoms and you vaporize it, you will get all molecules containing all possible combinations of those atoms. Um, which is, as far as we can tell, true. However, uh, you will maybe get orders of magnitude, different values, um, <clears throat> different numbers. Um, so usually we just like try a bunch of things. So you, know, you, just, you try all sorts of different things and you vaporize them and you see which one gives you the most of what you want, um, including you know, weird stuff. Like these are all things, not to give away the answer, these are all things that I've tried uh, vaporizing to make the molecule I want. Rocks from a gift shop, watch parts from eBay, crackpot health supplement, dog antacid. And they all worked according to this law. They all worked. They all gave us the molecules we wanted. But some worked better than others. Um, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> you can also, you can sort of push, you know, you can use chemistry to kind of push the uh, reactions. Because you get this like soup of things that are reacting. Um, you can push the chemistry to give what you want by, for example, exciting um, a metal to some excited states that has energy to overcome reaction barriers and give you the molecules you want, including if they're energetically forbidden. Um, so this is a trick you can use to, um, to make, especially these kinds of molecules, these like uh, single S uh, electrons, single S electron molecules. Um, <clears throat> So just as, a, as an aside, um, I'd mentioned this earlier, um, ab initio methods these days are very good. You, know, you can get like 1% accuracy on things and sometimes even better. So thank you theorists for doing all that. But you still need to do experiments because 1% on an optical transition is still like terahertz. And these transitions, the sort of fundamental width of these is usually like 10 megahertz or less. And so you, you still need to find these lines in the lab. Um, so, you know, there's job security uh, for people like me. <clears throat> um, how you go, just in a, in, a, in a few PowerPoint bullets, how do you go from like, oh, this molecule looks great. We predicted it on our computer. Like, this looks fantastic to like, how do you do it in the lab? Um, first, you have to do like broadband spectroscopy to sort of carve out big swaths um, of the potential space. So for example, you can do things like dispersed laser induced fluorescence. This is something that I said I would mention earlier about like how do you find all these vibrational levels. Here's one way to kind of find them all at once. Um, you excite some, you scan a laser until you find some transition in a molecule. 
Uh, so it starts fluorescing, and then you disperse the fluorescence, for example, on a diffraction grating, and then you image the dispersed light. And so, uh, and if you are careful enough, you can sort of resolve all of the vibrational decays. And so you can, with sort of one measurement like this, you can measure branching ratios and vibrational energy levels and all sorts of things. Um, <clears throat> these, this, these, a lot of these techniques um, are not new. Um, but they've been having a revival as like people have been getting a lot of, there's been renewed interest in like small molecule structure and spectroscopy because of stuff like this. Um, so a lot of these kind of old techniques are being re revitalized. Um, and then you can do follow up like narrow precision spectroscopy. And like realistically, this usually takes years to go from like this molecule looks cool to like here's what the energy levels and constants are. Um, but you know, <clears throat> uh, it's, it's fun. So you start with a beam of these molecules, and ultimately uh, you want to, to do a most like precision measurement or quantum sensing or quantum information applications. You want them to be in a trap so you can interrogate them for long periods of time. Um, and with neutrals at least, <clears throat> it's, it's tricky um, because this beam you make has forward velocity. It has sort of energy in the forward direction, which is typically like around 100 Kelvin or so, even though it's coming out of like a few Kelvin source, there's some hydrodynamic effects that make that energy in the forward direction much higher, sort of more like 100 Kelvin. Um, and most traps that people use for neutrals, um, they only will grab things that are below like 10 meters a second. If it's too fast, it'll just shoot right through the trap. And so you have to take this beam and slow it. You know, there's some finite capture velocity where uh, range over which they'll fall into the trap and everything else will just kind of shoot right through. <clears throat> so you have to slow the beam. Um, this turns out experimentally is the most difficult part. And I think earlier I'd mentioned like inefficiencies in these experiments. This is the most inefficient step um, by far. Um, <clears throat> so uh, one of the most common types of traps um, is uh, uses optical forces from lasers, which I think I had promised a few people over breakfast I would talk about. Um, and so here's the idea. If you, sh if you scatter photons off something, because photons have momentum, you'll apply a force. So if I have an atom and I shoot a photon at it this way, um, and the, f the atom absorbs the photon, the atom will get a momentum kick, which is h over lambda of the wavelength of the photon. That's the, that's the momentum of a photon. And then, <clears throat> It won't stay excited forever. It'll eventually spontaneously decay. But because the direction of the spontaneous, there's no preferred direction for the spontaneous emission, on average, it's zero. And so on average, you will have shifted the momentum of this atom by h over lambda. And so if you repeat this many times, you can actually apply very large forces. Of course, to do this many times, you need to cycle photons. So, but we already talked about how to do that. Um, <clears throat> Realistically, you need like 10 to the 4 or 5 uh, photon scatters um, to, say, stop a, a beam. So that's why earlier I had mentioned that the ability to sort of calculate and measure these things on the 10 to the minus 4 level was, was important. That's because that's actually how many you need to do a lot of these applications. Um, there's a you know, technical aside that I'll just uh, skip. <clears throat> uh, there's a cool trick you can play. Um, using uh, something called optical molasses. If you have two counter-propagating lasers, and they're both slightly red detuned, meaning that the wavelengths are both slightly below uh, or slightly longer than the resonance, the frequency is slightly lower than the transition frequency. If the atom moves toward, say, this laser, it will get Doppler shifted into resonance, and it will start scattering photons from this laser and get pushed this way. And vice versa, if it moves this way, it'll start scattering photons from that laser and get pushed that way. So you get a, uh, a restoring force proportional to the velocity, or it's not a restoring force, it's a viscous damping force, which opposes the motion, and that gives you cooling. Um, and so you can use this trick to cool atoms to kind of micro-Kelvin-ish, or molecules to micro-Kelvin temperatures. And that turns out to be kind of low enough to start doing you know, quantum-y stuff with it. <clears throat> Um, I'll skip, I'll just skip that. So to relate this to, so these are the, I think I had mentioned earlier, these are the types of things people have been doing with atoms for a while and it's very sophisticated, like making these 
kind of quantum simulators and quantum gas microscopes where you have individual control over all of these atoms and you can make them interact and read out their state. And um, <clears throat> if you want to, you know, the, if you want to build something like this for molecules, um, you know, you kind of want to start from where these folks have started. Um, <clears throat> uh, and not all experiments, but these experiments at least, um, use something called optical dipole traps. Um, so optical dipole trapping, um, you can, is, it's almost a classical effect where, you know, something dielectric, dielectrics are attracted to a field maximum. So if you take, uh, if you take a laser and you focus it and you choose the frequency of the laser correctly, um, the atom, which is our molecule, which is dielectric, will be drawn to the, to the center, to the position, uh, to the maximum field position, which is at the center of the focus. So all you have to do in principle is just focus a laser beam and molecules can get trapped in it. Uh, however, it's, ch it's challenging because these are typically limited to a few millikelvin. So it, they have to be pretty cold to start with to even fall into this trap. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I'll skip this. I'm starting, now that I'm getting towards the end, I'm going to start skipping more things. But I'm happy to go back uh, and talk about stuff. Um, so now to kind of, you know, to sort of bring it all together, I think I, I promised this slide at some point. Um, <clears throat> So in the past few years, like using this like optical cycling center uh, motif, um, people have started to realize um, the you know the ingredients of quantum control um, in molecules, um, <clears throat> things like laser cooling and optical dipole traps and tweezer arrays and things like that. Um, but it's still all very very new, especially for like for neutral species. So like here's something that looks very quantumy, which is like you know gates and things like that, right? Except now this is with molecules. These are sort of individually controlled calcium fluoride molecules cooled to ultra cold temperatures in an optical dipole trap and showing that you can do things like entangling gates um, and things like that. But you'll also notice that, you know, this is a, these are, this is a very recent result. These, these, this has just happened like last year. Um, so this is a, all this is kind of just starting to come online in some sense. <clears throat> Um, I think, uh, yeah, so there's this another um, uh, relating back to what I was talking about with the electromagnetic control and the quantum coherence. Um, this is a very useful tool for doing quantum control in these molecules, these, these uh, sort of electric fields where the magnetic sensitivity vanishes. Um, so this is, a, this is a like calculated plot of what this should look like. Um, but uh, you can also uh, measure this. You can see that these, you can measure the magnetic sensitivity by applying a magnetic field versus electric field. And you can see that at least as well as you can measure it, it, it goes to zero, it gets very small. Um, and practically, you know, what does that win you? That wins you if you're limited by magnetic effects in your decoherence, which these, these types of experiments typically are. Um, you can suppress that quite a bit. So for example, if you operate at some electric field over here where the magnetic sensitivity is like order unity, um, and you measure and you take, you know, in this case it was like ultra cold calcium hydroxide molecules in an optical dipole trap and spin polarize them and measure their coherence, you know, you get something, you know, a couple hundred microseconds. Um, but then if you just tune your electric field over here, um, you can suppress the magnetic uh, sensitivity by a lot, and you can get much longer coherence up to, um, in this experiment, it was 30 milliseconds of um, electron spin coherence in these molecules, uh, <clears throat> which we think you can push to even, to much longer. Um, this was done in a very noisy chamber with like no magnetic shielding and uh, sort of very bad everything. Um, <clears throat> but uh, so this is sort of showing that you can, these sort of additional degrees of freedom of polyatomic molecules in particular, you can use to do interesting, coherent quantum things. Um, so maybe I'll, uh, I'll end with this, you know, <clears throat> this is something that, you know, why not just use atoms? That's kind of what people have been asking. 
And like laser cooling atoms is like a common undergrad lab thing. Like make a magneto optical trap of atoms. Um, not that it's easy, but it's just like, you know, it's an, un it's an undergrad lab. Um, so why is laser cooling molecules still so hard? It sounds like I just listed like, oh, here's the solution. Like just do this. Um, <clears throat> Lasers are expensive and time consuming. So you need a lot of lasers. They have to be high power um, at like random wavelengths. Um, but also just producing the molecules is hard. It turns out you just, you can, no matter what you do, uh, you can't make as many molecules as you can atoms. If you have ideas to make molecules, you should, we should talk because we'll probably try it out. Um, <clears throat> and then, uh, Slowing is hard and inefficient. A lot of the tricks that atoms use don't work for molecules, um, unfortunately. And just molecules are complicated. Like it's, it takes years of spectroscopy. If you think, if you want to study some molecule, you usually have to do spectroscopy on it first for years. Um, whereas for atoms, the spectroscopy is, is already known. Um, <clears throat> so that's why this is still hard. And uh, I will stop there. I, was go I don't have time to talk about extending these optical cycling motifs to other species. I'll just, or other types of species. So I will just say um, that people are now starting to think about like, are there types of molecular structures other than this like single SP polarized valence thing where you get photon cycling in molecules? Um, and the answer is, we just ask me later and we'll talk about it. Yeah. Um, how can we confirm that we have done the laser cooling? Like, do we monitor, do we monitor the temperature continuously, or how can we verify? <coughs> and is there a particular temperature that when we get there, then we say this is ideal for? Yeah. So, um, oh, that, I thought this one had pictures on it. <coughs> so the the re, so the way you can tell. Um, that something's been cooled usually um, is you just like you just look at the velocity distribution and see if it was compressed. Um, so for example, um, if you have a beam, usually people start with just making a beam and just cool it in the transverse direction because it's you know it's sort of easy to cool things in one direction. And you just so if you're making a beam and you cool it, then after you cool it, it should sort of stop diverging. And so you should get basically a compression of the spatial extent of the beam if you've cooled it successfully. For something like this, where they, where they think they have made a trap, like a magneto optical trap, um, the real, pr I get the, the practical proof is you just like wait for so long that any of the molecules would have just flown away and see if they're still there. Um, but also, you can you can give them a kick and see if their position oscillates. That's kind of the real test. That are they in like sort of a harmonic trap? Is if they're in a harmonic trap, they should oscillate when you kick them. So you can load them into a trap, just blast them with a bunch of photons, and then measure the position and see if they oscillate. That's the kind of proof that they're trapped. But like practically, the proof is that like if they're still there after like 100 milliseconds, like they're definitely trapped because the beam would take like less than a millisecond to fly through it. Yeah. And as far as temperature, I think it's like colder is always better because it uh, depends what you want to do with it. But usually, the fact that um, Ideally, they would all be sort of at the bottom of the trap. If they have temperature, they'll sample more of the trap. And, that, and the trap shifts their properties and things like that. So ideally, you would want them to be at you know, zero Kelvin, or at least low enough that they don't have any energy to even excite like the motional modes of the trap, um, which for these tightly focused tweezer traps is on the order of like micro Kelvin. Um, yeah. Maybe as a follow up question on that. If I remember correctly, there's a um, limit for optical cooling, right? Uh, right. And if I remember correctly, it does not depend on the mass; it only depends on like the spontaneous emission rate, because that kind of gives you the limit. limit. So right. Maybe uh, would this not also be like an advantage of molecules that potentially you could cool much more if you manage to somehow master all the challenges? You could cool much more massive <coughs> objects. Or potentially do like, I don't know, condensation. <clears throat> yeah, so the, unfortunately, the trade off is that, um, so for these molecules, uh, yeah, I think I have this bullet point, but I didn't say it. Um, generally limited vibrational, by vibrational loss. 
These experiments are generally limited by the fact that you only have, you have a finite budget of photons you can scatter. And it's like, okay, you can get more lasers and scatter more photons, but like the scaling is, you know, uh, challenging. As opposed to atoms, atoms you can cycle photons indefinitely. Um, and people have done experiments where they say like, um, have cycled photons off of an atom like at a megahertz rate for like hours and hours and hours. And, uh, but you can't do that here. You know, if you scatter, if you scatter photons at full rate, off of these molecules, you know, they're, they're going to be in some other state you don't want in like less than a set, much less than a second. Um, <clears throat> and a lot of the, there are like, there are a lot of tricks to do like really deep cooling with lasers. Um, but a lot of times those rely on the ability to scatter like many, many photons. And so I think it's, it's hard to imagine. So people have laser cooled atoms all the way to quantum degeneracy, like using these various tricks to beat the Doppler limit. It'd be very hard to imagine doing something like that with molecules because it's like, okay, as the mass goes up, the Doppler temperature would go down. You don't really care about the Doppler temperature, it turns out, because you want to do these like sub-Doppler things, um, which are not limited by that. <clears throat> but the trade-off with the molecules is the heavier you make it, the more complicated it becomes and the more leakage channels you have and so the fewer photons you can scatter. So, um, People recently made, uh, <clears throat> in, the la in the last few months, made a sort of quantum degenerate gas of bosonic molecules, and several years ago made a quantum degenerate gas of fermionic molecules, but they did it with evaporative cooling, which is basically the same way that they make quantum degenerate gases for atoms, except in sort of sp special circumstances. Yeah. <clears throat> So I think that would be, if you just want to study like ultra-cold quantum gases, I would say that would be an, an instance where it's like, just use atoms, you know, don't, don't suffer through the molecules. Yeah.